The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good day. Welcome to the fourth in our series of Smart Thinking webinars. Our focus today is on resilience, and uh, I want to thank you for taking your time out of your busy day. I know everyone's uh, is pushed these days, and uh, it's a real measure of resilience that you can actually take time to learn about a new topic. Our focus over these last few months has been on providing you with pr some practical tools and tips that you can use based on the research I've been doing into a particular topic. We tend to focus on one book, and in this particular case, I'll be drawing on a number of sources. And uh, our, our time is approximately 30 minutes, and it'll be moving fairly quickly. The, the presentation itself uh, is going to be looking at um, um, the work of an author called Andrew Zoli. His book, Resilience, Why Things Bounce Back, was published in the last six months, and I quite enjoyed it. It's a big picture kind of look at resilience, and hopefully you're going to find some things that are, are, will be of particular value, particular value in the work that you do. Um, the webinar will be recorded, and you'll be able to access it and share it with other people, and we will also post the slides on SlideShare. Um, and so if you want to receive a copy of the slide deck and or the webinar, you, it'll be sent to you in the next 48 hours. If you have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to submit your questions by simply typing in the text box uh, where it says chat, and we'll do our best to answer your questions as quickly as we can. Um, for those of you who like to tweet, and I know there are those of you out there who are on the Twitter verse all the time, uh, please avail yourself of that, and we always offer a couple of prizes to those who participate in the conversation. Why this book? Um, I was really intrigued by um, what Zoli was all about in this book, and uh, resilience is clearly top of mind in many places these days, both in education and in business. What he does in the book is take a very large, uh, big picture approach from societies to companies to social movements, right down to um, looking at engineering and uh, individual life. And I found he's got lessons for all leaders, for educators, and learning leader professionals. Would I recommend it as a go-to book? No, I would recommend it as for someone who's interested in the broader field of resilience. I think you're going to find it particularly valuable. Uh, and it's all based on the premise that, as Einstein said, in the middle of every difficulty lies opportunity. Resilience is all about not what happens to you, but how you bounce back. And the webinar today is going to cover five key points. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the context. We're going to define what resilience is as Zoli sees it and how other leading, leaders in the field have defined it. Uh, I've picked out several um, tips and techniques on developing a more resilient mind. We'll look at some of the research that he cites on building resilient teams, particularly with a focus on diversity. And I want to end up with the work of a wonderful woman out of Pennsylvania, Angela Lee Duckworth, who has identified what she calls grit, which really parallels the work we've been doing in personal spirit. For those of you who don't know our company, our, our work in One Smart World basically is to help people and teams succeed by learning how to think better and work smarter together. We work in two major arenas. In the business side, we accelerate collaborative teamwork and innovation in progressive enterprises. Um, and in education, our focus is on delivering five essential 21st century employability schools, skills for student success. In both cases, it's built off our One Smart World Total Intelligence platform that contains a, an instrument called the 40i that maps thinking styles and builds a skills portfolio for success in the 21st century, and then has a process productivity piece to help teams work better, whether they're in business or in group projects in, in uh, colleges. Our clients on the corporate side are, are um, tend to be on the larger side. We have not-for-profit organizations in there. We have manufacturing, aerospace companies, uh, schools of business. And on the um, education side, we've got a mix of school boards, community colleges, and universities. Uh, all our clients tend to be more on the progressive side, looking for new ways to serve their clients better, whether it's in business or in education. Now, the theme number one in our, in our presentation today uh, if we have big tides built, we have to build better boats. And this is a quote that I think is pretty appropriate for the kind of work and the world we live in these days. Um, some of you may be familiar with the military term VUCA, which refers to these four conditions of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And that certainly defines the, the realm of work that many of our clients work in, we certainly work in. And even looking at young people going through the school system these days, 
uh, there's no straight line. There's no uh, start to finish kind of line for them. I've added an, an extra A on the front of it because I really think the the pace of change is so rapid these days. And so I put in an accelerated in there. So that's kind of the world that uh, resilience needs to operate in. And so it's got to be stronger than ever before. If you look at these four symbols, you can see Apple went from the verge of bankruptcy in the last decade or so to now the world's most valuable company. General Motors was on the verge of bankruptcy at the great financial collapse of 2008 and showed its resilience by bouncing back to be a market leader again. On the other hand, companies like Blockbuster and Polaroid never never were able to adapt to the changes in their marketplaces and are and now gone the way of the dodo. And when we think of resilient people, you know, I think of people in my life who uh, my brother-in-law, Bill, who was a remarkable, remarkable man. You look at the people here in the photos, Oscar Pistorius, you know, who was a, the Olympic athlete who competed both in the Olympic Games and in the Paralympic Games. Gabby Gifford, who bounced back from that horrible shooting um, in her constituency a couple of years ago. And then, of course, Stephen Hawking, who, uh, despite being afflicted, was able to bring out one of the most brilliant minds of his generation. So when we look at resilience, our second topic, um, Zoli describes it as the capacity of a system, enterprise, or a person to maintain its core purpose and integrity in the face of dramatically changed circumstances. So resilience is something that really does, isn't get, doesn't get called on until things happen around you. And it's in that response capability. And as you can see, he talks about system, broad, enterprise, organization, or person. And what he does, he looks at it from different angles. So in engineering, a resilience is seen to be a property of a structure. And how resilient is the bridge? How resilient is the building to withstand the uh, aftershocks of a, of a tsunami or an earthquake? There's an energy building in Calgary that has been identified as the most resilient building in the world, given the kinds of structural things they put into the building. Now, resilience is also part of our um, emergency response. And, and uh, government organizations look at how resilient are we to respond to emergencies like a flood or like an earthquake or like what happened in, um, in, uh, with Hurricane Katrina uh, several years ago. How resilient are we in terms of being able to respond? It's also part of nature. How resilient is nature, uh, given the onslaught of things like climate change, for example, that are having a significant impact on everything from the weather patterns to how you know how much skiing we get done in the wintertime. In business, resilience is seen to be a, a, cap a basically a factor of measuring if if there's a computer breakdown or a systems breakdown. How resilient are we in terms of having the backup that we need? Or how resilient are we in terms of having the, the capabilities that we require to continue to function? And in business, uh, and, and, in, and in psychology rather, resilience has seemed to be a property or a, an element or capacity that people have uh, to deal with the kinds of things that are coming at them. So a resilient person is someone who can withstand the ongoing changes that are, that are occurring in the company or in their own lives and continue to steer through their, their, their way. Um, I really like this little slide here. This is to me the kind of the where you get up in the morning. You know, do I put my plug into the bottom one in my energy for my energy and start off on a negative side and, and, and get all that negative negative energy flowing, or do I plug into the top one? And this is resilience. Resilience is, is about that where do I choose to put my plug and then how do I begin to work what comes out? So one of the things that Zoli talks about is the remarkable finding that resilience is is something that's really quite natural it's not a it's not the possession of super athletes or superhuman people it's in all of us and and he looks at disasters that have occurred uh, you know in terms of um uh how societies respond and and he and he talks about how much uh this appears to be a common phenomenon and masters is a research that he cited that he that he uh, cited and she was quite astonished by how much the uh, the factor of resilience appears as an everyday kind of thing. So it seems to be built in from an, evolu an evolutionary point of view that uh, it's part of who we are. In the work that we do, uh, we look at three three aspects of resilience. Um, we've we've been at this now for over for eleven years, and we I identified three key factors. One is one's outlook. And the more positive one's outlook is, the more broadly we take in what's all around us. And the more we tend to be able to understand that 
And it, when we take that positive outlook and we tie it into our sense of control, the greater our sense of control is, the more resilient we are. And the more resilient we are, the more likely we are to take initiative and take action. Because part of what resilience is, is not only a frame of mind, it's also the ability to take action. So the research that Zoli refers to talks about how we as a species, are we're designed for resilience. This is not an unusual thing, but it can certainly be strengthened. And some of the elements are listed here, the optimism and positive outlook that we work with, the ability to bounce back and steer through uh, adversity, and the importance of feeling as if you're in control, that you can maneuver, adjust, and respond, not just react. And uh, as the optimists like to talk ab about, it's the ability to turn those lemons into lemonade by reframing and transforming what happens to us. Uh, friends of mine were involved in a, a very difficult family situation a couple of weeks ago, and I was astonished at their ability to reframe and reappraise what happened in the light of a larger context of a person's life. It was quite remarkable to watch um, how people who are in great emotional strain were able to still take that event that had happened and were able to turn that around from the point of view of seeing the value, the overall value in, in what had happened. The other thing they found is that if you are part of a church group or a social club or a, a, a large uh, cohesive family, that social support, that, uh, that ability to have people around you as a buffer is really, really critical to your resilience. And one of the other things we found, and we found the same thing with our research on personal spirit, that uh, younger people, particularly in, in um, under 20, uh, have a very level, low level of, of personal spirit and resilience. And over time, uh, resilience gets better with age. And the research he cites is that people over 65 are the, are the, are the most resilient of all, perhaps because they've been around long enough to have been, been through a lot of adversity. So our third topic is going to look at how to develop a resilient mind. And what I've done here is I've, I've delved into Zoli's work and also the work of some other experts in the area, just to give you some of the, the sense of what's, what they're coming up with. There seem to be two ways of approaching the world around us. One is to be in a more defensive and contracted state of mind. The other one is to say, well, this is what life is about all the time. If I reach out, engage, and connect, I'm more likely to learn from that and to grow from that. And if I can focus on putting in the right kinds of behaviors, and you see a lot of this in the positive you know, lifestyle change around diet and exercising and stopping smoking, by putting in the positive conditions and the positive emotions, you begin to build a positive, uh, self-fulfilling uh, prophecy kind of thing and a positive spiral. When I looked at um, the mental traps that people get in, and I wrote, this is in uh, my little book, Smart for Life, I, I came up with a series of uh, mind traps that really can get in the way of us being resilient. One of them, the first one of which is a closed mind. We're working with a, a number of educational institutions, and we had a couple of people really shock me in the last two weeks, uh, professors in both cases, who, who were quite adamant that they really didn't need to learn anymore. They knew everything they needed to know. And I thought, man, I, in, in, in other circumstances, you, you should be fired on the spot. Um, learning is all, life is all about learning and learning is all about life and, and the most effective people are the learners. The second um, um, major mind trap that we see is overconfidence in one's judgment. And you often see this with experts who, who, who jump to conclusions much too quickly about what's right or wrong and then begin to follow, that, follow down that path. And that's often tied into diving in. Diving in is a syndrome of not not stepping back, taking in enough information and just saying, I know what I need to do. I just got to start mucking around as opposed to pulling back and saying, what's really happening here and what's the crux of the problem? The fourth one, solving the wrong problem perfectly. Man, I remember doing this with a, a, a business partner a number of years ago where we came up with the best 60 minute training video you've ever seen. The problem was from the time we started to when we ended, the market had gone from 60 minute videos to 20 minute videos and now it's down to two or three minute videos we'd solve the wrong problem perfectly i don't know if that's ever happened to you the last three are again mental mental traps one is around catastrophizing you know people who walk around with the black cloud over their head and they're always waiting for the worst kind of thing to happen that that's really not a good way to build your resilience uh because you, again you, you're in that defensive protective kind of uh, frame of mind busy spinning wheels is that mistaking being busy with for progress. And that's people who are running around all the time. Nothing's really going on in terms of moving the, moving the pee down the, down the, down the field. 
but man, they, they look really, they really look busy, but nothing's going on. And the final one is, um, and this is in the resilience literature as well. Sometimes when you get so stressed, uh, you get so overwhelmed, you're almost mindless. You, you, you don't stop and think through. So mind traps are a critical piece in our resilience research. And Karen Revich, for those of you who know the field, is a real rock star in the resilience field. One of her books has become a landmark book in the, in the, um, in the domain. But she talks about the importance of thinking style, that it's, and thinking style is a choice. And she says it's like a lens through which we view the world, that everyone has such a lens and it colors the way we interpret the events in our lives, either positively or negatively or neutrally. And our thinking style is what causes you to respond mostly to events, positively or negatively, uh, fearfully or, or embracingly. And so it's our thinking style that determines our level of resilience, our ability to overcome, steer through and bounce back when adversity occurs. So watch the way you think, because the way you think will, will determine the kind of results that you get. She identified four pillars of resilience. And as you can see here, she looks like a pretty resilient woman herself. Uh, she said, first of all, you have to accept if you, that life change is a possibility. If you feel that you're a victim and you're stuck, then you really are stuck and you won't be able to move forward. And that moving forward depends on your ability to think well. And it's not just think well, it's being really precise and focused in your thinking. So using your thinking as a tool to move you forward. And again, based on that, to focus on what you can do as opposed to what you can't do. When we looked at personal spirit with students, let me show you some of the results we found with uh, first year students versus, versus students who've been around a little bit longer. Um, here are the, here's some research we did over the last couple of years. The bars on the left, the two bars on the left are first year students taking courses uh, who came in and their, their personal spirit is uh, significantly below the norm of 50. So the normative population of 25,000 people that this was based on, um, these students are coming in with a low personal spirit, which means they, they are more likely to drop out. And um, you hear professors and deans walk around saying, look to your left, look to your right. You know, one out of three of you or two, uh, you know, 50% of you won't, won't finish the program, which is a terrible message to give. These are people who are already vulnerable and worried about whether they can succeed or not. On the right-hand side of the, of the chart, you see the, the MBA uh, students at Dalhousie University, one of our clients, whose personal spirit is clearly uh, well above the norm. They come in with a level of resilience and a sense of confidence, a positive outlook and sense of control that will mean that they're likely to be highly effective when they go into the workplace. So that's, that's what personal spirit results that we're finding shows about resilience. Zoli talks a lot about meditation studies. For those of you who don't know meditation, uh, it is, it's often a, uh, linked to some religions like Buddhism or Christianity where, where people actually stop and meditate. The work that is being done right now is non-denominational non meditation, where it's literally a practice. Like a, it's like a mental practice that parallels the kind of physical practices that the health, uh, lifestyle and fitness folks have brought in. But instead of being vigorous and busy and exercising our, our aerobic and anaerobic systems and our muscles, this is about quieting down. And meditation consistently has shown that well, it will increase our awareness and sense of control. Uh, it gets, increases our compassion. Uh, it reduces our anxiety and fear. It increases resilience. I've been meditating for uh, approximately 25 years, and I find it as a little anchor in the morning. My 15 minutes just sitting there watching listening to my breath and watching my thoughts come and go, uh, really act as a relaxing and calming kind of effect. Zoli talks about uh, three types of um, meditation or mindfulness practices. One of them is a focused attention, which we often see depicted in film, you know, where people sit there and they focus on their breath and just watch their thoughts and feelings come and go without getting attached to any of that. No sense of urgency, no sense of ownership, just watching them come and go, because that's really how our mind works. The second uh, type of meditation that they looked at was around open monitoring, where you just sit there and, and feel the sensations around you. You don't particularly focus on your breath. You, you're just watching, what, feeling what's going on around you, again, with uh, no judgment. And the third type is a, a um, type of meditation that looks at focusing in a compassionate way on someone you love, someone you know, or someone you don't like, and and, and sending and feeling warmth and um, compassion for their situation. 
as another fellow human being who may not be on the same page as you, but it may be struggling as well in their own particular way. So these are the kinds of things that the research is finding that mindfulness and meditation is particularly helpful to build that resilient mind. One of the frameworks that has been very successful in the resilience research was built, developed by Salvador Maddy and his colleague Suzanne Cobasa when they were doing the original work on hardiness. And they came up with a little uh, framework called situation reconstruction. We've used this with executives. It's been used a lot with executives who are going through a lot of change inside their organizations or downsizing or right-sizing. Or, um, and it's also been used with students. And it's a, just a, a kind of a mental walkthrough that says, pick a stressful situation that's bothering you right now. And then think about, and, and it's often useful to write, it, write this stuff down because it gives you a bit more sense of control. So think about how it could be worse. So compared to what's going on, it could how could it be worse? And think out how, how it could be better. If things were a little bit better, what would that look like? Then the fourth step was to make up a story. How it could go from, how the worst situation could even go further south and go bad on you. And then make up a parallel story about how the, the situation that, if it was better, could, e could go even more effectively for you. And then the most important step is to say, now, now that I've looked at these two alternatives, you know, door number one, it could go bad, and door number two, it could get better. What specifically will I do to prevent the worst from happening and achieve the better result? And what the research has shown over and over again, just by going through this in a very deliberate and systematic way, gives the person a sense of understanding the dynamics at work and recognizes the, recognizing the impact that their own action could take on achieving that better result. So this is something I really recommend you try or use as, use as a coach um, or an enabler uh, or a manager in working with someone who's undergoing a difficult time. Now looking to our fourth topic, building the resilient team, um, we work with diversity a lot. And we know, for example, that uh, in the workplace today, particularly in large global organizations and in many urban-based uh, companies, uh, increasingly, the demographic diversity is what we see more of. It's in demographic means our culture, our ethnicity, our age, our gender, um, our sexual orientation, who we are. A second level of diversity is what we know and do. So each of us brings different levels of experience um, and expertise to the table. So in many large organizations and projects, you've got people who have demographic diversity but they also are coming from different uh, walks of life and experience bases, so they haven't got a common language. And then the third level is cognitive style. You, you, you add that to the mix that we think and feel in different ways. And in our case, in our, our work, we, have, we use a color-coded common language to determine and uh, to identify how people like to think and then use that as a, as a common language to overcome the demographic and knowledge and skills diversity to provide a platform for people to meet together. So yellow being understanding, uh, green being creativity, red being decision-making, and white being initiating. So if we understand how people think and that they know different things, you can use this common language to get on the same page. Now, in looking at uh, the work that Zoli describes in his, his book, he cites a number of studies that I found were really helpful around what's the impact of homogeneity or diversity on team performance. And when you've got similar groups of scientists, for example, with similar backgrounds versus uh, the, the cognitively styled, a demographically diverse group of scientists, what happens when they get together? Who wins and how do they do that? Well, Kevin Dunbar, who until about a month ago was a professor at the University of Toronto, he's just moved to uh, the University of Maryland, he's a psychologist, has done a lot of research on what happens when different people get together. He found consistently that when teams were homogeneous, they didn't produce nearly as good a result as when they had the right amount of diversity. And when they had that diversity was there, they, people could, the team could draw on different levels of experience. So be careful of when you put teams together to make sure you've got the right mix. We've talked about this before in our previous webinars, but um, the volume, the speed, and revenue generated by the work all went up when you had the right amount of diversity. If you have too much, then it's, there's too much opportunity for chaos and dysfunction. So finding the right mix of talent with highly cognitively diverse teams will produce more resilient and better performance. So this is really interesting because I find in the work we do, it's the cognitive style diversity that's the invisible factor. And once you, you bring that out by helping people understand how they like to think, 
then it makes it much easier to build a, 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 a climate of tolerance, acceptance, and indeed a, one of leveraging the talent that people have. So diverse teams tend to outperform homogeneous teams. Homogeneous teams often take things for granted and don't have the wealth of experience to draw upon. So diversity is a, is a challenge. It's difficult to overcome, but it's also a solution if, 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 if it's managed correctly. The other thing is to set the bar high. If you expect great results and set high norms, you're more likely to be effective. There was a Dilbert cartoon today about uh, um, if you have positive norms in a group, uh, it can be very motivating. And you can imagine by the second panel where they went with that, how, how the norms are contagious. Um, and Dilbert is not about positive norms, for sure, or positive behavior. So if you have diverse teams and you, you can expect to get better solutions, on, on particularly on complex problems, but it's critical to invest in building those relationships and, and, and developing that common ground first. Because if you don't do that, the demographic diversity can kind of get you. So... Zoli uh, reports on the work of a, a husband and wife couple called the Aarons, and um, they've focused on diversity as a solution in organizations, but, it, but if managed properly, can really be leveraged. And they came up with a four-step process. It takes four hours to do this. And you think of a project team whose life is going to be many months. The investment on that team building up front, that uh, investment on let's build relationships and mutual understanding and respect can contribute huge payoffs in the long run and can really be a key success factor in making sure that diversity is used in a very constructive and effective way. So what the four-step process is, and you can think of this as a team building application as well. Um, the first phase is around deep knowing. So they, they produced a, a series of questions that people do in a dialogue format to get to know each other. You know, uh, what are some of the likes what are the things you really like in, in, in life and in your life? And what are some of the hopes? So you're kind of talking about who you are and what your future, your desired future is. Then they put people through some fun games like um, charades and that kind of thing, where people are competing in teams, but it's just, it's around bonding and coming up with the solutions to these on the spot situations that people begin to get, again, feel a kind of an emotional closeness. Then the third level is uh, a series of guided discussions on quite, um, uh, more personal questions than the, than the first stage on who you are and what you're all about. And uh, again, that deepens the relationship and connection between the folks. And then the final step is around the trust walk, where you pretty, literally put your yourself in the hands of another person to guide you. Now, when I looked at this, I thought, boy, this is something that can be done um, in quite an effective way in a fairly short period of time that can have long-term payoffs. So this was something I really liked. The work that we do uh, in working with teams has focused on some of the same themes of so taking diversity as a fact of life, using our four colored common language as a way of getting people on the same page, then using that as a disciplined process so people can actually all do the same type of thinking at the same time. And we use rules of engagement to make sure that people are all rowing in the same direction at the same pace. And the fifth point is around positivity. And I just wanted to share with you the work of Marcel Losada. Um, Losada has done work with uh, high-performing teams in, uh, at the executive level, but he's also worked with minors. And he found um, in his research a key success factor and a key predictor of success is what he calls the 5 to 1 ratio. It's now known as the Losada line. You can look up Losada um, on the web and you can access some of his articles. Uh, he's never written a book. Um, uh, he's in his seventies now. He and I have had a couple of conversations. He, but he's really he's he's been hired by the government of Brazil to give them a competitive advantage in the global marketplace. And, and you can see how well they're doing as not a, maybe not as a result of him, but they got the, they got the fact that his research was quite groundbreaking. So the five to one ratio basically means if you can maintain five positive statements for every negative one in an ongoing conversation with colleagues or in interpersonal relationships, you're much more likely to be successful than not. So that five to one, even in, even in disagreements, the five to one underneath it um, has a culture of respect and appreciation for differences. And in doing that, you help build the resilience in the relationship and also in the team. So when, when dramatically changed circumstances happen, that kind of bedrock of respect, appreciation, 
is built into the teams. And much like the Aaron's do with their four-step process, in building the relationship, it builds the, it builds the connections that make you more resilient. I want to finish with the fifth point, and this is the power of grit. Uh, Martin Seligman, who is the distinguished professor who's behind one of the driving forces behind the positive psychology movement, in his book, Flourish, talks about Angela Lee Duckworth, who was the first doctoral student ever accepted at the University of Pennsylvania, who didn't have quite the right, right SAT score, but had this unbelievable impact in, uh, in the work that she was doing. And she's gone on to build something called grit. And grit is very much like our personal spirit. And so I want to I want to share with you the findings that she's come up with, because I think it has real relevance to both of you, both those of you who are in education or those of you who are in business. And for those of you in business who have children, this is, again, very, very compelling findings. What what Zoli and Duckworth both talk about is the contrast between the victim mindset and the resilience mindset. The victim mindset, you know, oh, those poor people over there, you rob them of take of taking responsibility for their own situation. And we focus more on changing the conditions by fixing what's bad and focusing on the past. The resilient mind, mindset is a whole different way of looking at things. You take responsibility for your circumstances. You you become accountable for your for your life, regardless of what where you came from. And you focus more on what can I do to move forward? And you focus on what's going well and how do I leverage that to be more effective? And you, you're drawn more by the future than pulled back by the past. So that's the resilience mindset. When she looked at, at high performers, she came up with this great formula. Um, achievement equals talent multiplied by effort. If, you're, if you have a lot of talent, but don't put in the time, you're going to get left behind the dust. She said, tremendous effort can compensate for modest skill, just as tremendous skills can compensate for modest effort, but not if either is zero. The more skilled you are, the greater the returns on effort, and effort is a driver of skill. So how do people get good? By working on their game. So grit, in her definition, is uh, what she calls extreme persistence, that ability that no matter what comes at you, you keep going. Uh, Thomas Edison talked about people being right on the verge of a major breakthrough, and just before they get there, they quit. So persistence at the high level is what grit is all about. And it involves sustained self-discipline. So looking at kids, and we try to protect our kids so much from uh, from life, as opposed to exposing them to failure and learning, and learning from failure and seeing everything as a learning opportunity. The thing you can't not do is make effort. Effort is a critical thing to success. And effort, as, they, as she defines it, is time on task. The more time you spend on something, the better you're going to be. Uh, I've spent three days getting this 30-minute webinar ready. And why? Because I want to make sure it's as good as it can be. So the effort, the time on task is a critical thing. And it's not just time on task. It's deliberately practicing on the things that you need to work on. So it's not just focusing on strengths. It's also focusing on the areas that you need to fill in to be more effective. In terms of those of you in education and in business, the grit, the grit difference, well, grit, the scores on her little eight-question questionnaire uh, predicted retention and grade point average at West Point better than SAT scores did. It predicted people in sales whether they would hang in after they got through the initial flurry, if, if they would be able to have that resilience uh, when uh, they were dealing with all the disappointment of rejection. It predicted retention in the special forces it predicted, and I love this one, they did research on the National Spelling Bee participants. And they really drilled down to find out, you know, how hard these kids worked. And the kids who worked harder, who had more grit, it consistently predicted who would get the best results. And she found that it wasn't just doing things that they liked to do. It was zeroing in the things that they didn't like, but, but would be useful in terms of getting their performance to where they wanted it to be. So it was not just time on task, it was smart time on task, gave you the grit edge. So grit, in a nutshell, is critical to resilience. Its achievement is equals talent multiplied by effort. And that the time on task actually doesn't add up to your skills, it becomes a multiplier. And so that's why in, in anything, practice, practice, practice. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. It's in the practicing and dedicating your time, often on things that are hard. So effort is about hard. It's not easy. So things that are hard to do are the ones that produce the most positive results. 
I'd like to finish the, the, the presentation with this great quote from Michael Gelb, who's written on um, about Edison and written about Michelangelo. And he says it really well. He says, resilience in the face of adversity is the greatest long-term predictor of success for both individuals and organizations. And persistence in the process of experimentation, when we're trying things out in the process of trial and error, when desired or expected results are elusive, is the way resilience is expressed. So resilience is a function of dealing with these difficult circumstances that Zoli describes in his book. So to summarize then, resilience, some of the messages from our, our, our conversation today, our presentation today, resilience is your ability to bounce back from adversity. So that's your bounce back, your spring back. It's built into most of us. And for those of us who, who have it or don't have it to the level we'd like to have it, it can be strengthened and, and developed by practice and by pushing ourselves with that effort. And that in teams and organizations, diversity is a key success factor if it's taken into account and worked with constructively, particularly at the front end, it'll really pay uh, dividends uh, as the team begins to get rolling and gets through the forming and storming to the norming and performing phase. And resilience is about sustained effort and deliberate practice. And it, it is a driver of success and achievement in anything that goes on. When you look at anybody on TV these days or in sport or in, or in music or in any field, it's the amount of time that people have put in that is the determining factor on whether they're going to be successful or not. If for those of you interested in the area, there's a number of good books out there. I, I, Resilience at Work by Salvador Maddy and Deborah Kobasa is a, is, a, is a relatively easy read and I thought had some really good points in it. Karen Revich's book with Andrew Shatty um, is, is more of a, it's more heavy lifting, Seven Essential Skills for Overcoming Life's Inevitable Obstacles. But it, again, if it's got some good stuff. And for those of you interested in positive psychology and some of the hard research coming out of uh, a number of fields uh, in that area, Martin Seligman's book, Flourish, is a real gem. It's a big, it's quite a thick book, um, but quite good. And uh, Zoli's book, uh, Resilience, for those of you who look, like to look at larger systems at play, I think you're going to find that quite valuable as well. Just to finish off, this is our little commercial at the end. For those of you who don't know us, we focus on improving personal and professional effectiveness. And, for, and uh, in uh, business, we, we do a lot of work in accelerating collaborative teamwork and innovation using our, our platform of the 4DI instrument and our Smarter Meetings and Rapid Innovation Program. And we work, as I mentioned, in, in both education and in business. And we have certification for learning professionals for those of you who want to take this into your practice or into your organization. Our upcoming courses for certification are both being held in Toronto in October, November, and December. As well, we uh, work with the Canadian Management Centre. They've got a couple of upcoming programs in Calgary in November on our Smarter Meetings application, uh, which yielded a 558% return on investment for WestJet and our Lead and Succeed for Personal Effectiveness in Calgary. Our next webinar, folks, is going to be uh, on October 17th, 2012, and we're going to feature the research work done by John Zenger and his colleagues on how to be exceptional. Uh, some things that I think will, will reinforce the messages that we've seen here in Resilience. So again, I want to thank you for your time. I really appreciate you uh, joining us. Uh, we are trying to come up with things that you will find useful. We encourage you to share both the slideshow um, and, the, and this webinar with your colleagues. So in light of that, I'd like to thank you for your time. I hope you have a wonderful, smart day, a smarter week, and hopefully we'll see you in a month. Take good care.